Hello everyone and welcome to CK Med. My name is Clark and I'll be taking you through multi-systems infectious microbiology today. I want to shout out to Nikki Shaw for creating the backbones of this PowerPoint and I've adapted it so that you can get important information for your step one exam. This is one of the most exciting and interesting sections of microbiology. So the first things that we're going to be talking about are vector carried viral infections and to start, to start things off the first we're going to get to is known as yellow fever virus. Um, this is a positive single sense uh, RNA flavivirus. It has an envelope. Uh, usually where you find this infection is in Africa or South America. Um, and travel history is something that's very important. So that's something you want to be looking for um, in the stem of your questions uh, in order to kind of help you come down to your diagnosis. Um, if they're asking a question about yellow fever, remember that the reservoirs uh, are from human to human. They travel uh, and picked up in mosquitoes, but also uh, their main reservoir are in monkeys. Um, and so it needs to be in more tropical areas where monkeys are. So like South America and Africa kind of makes sense. So for morph morphology, uh, some things that you would uh, be looking for as far as the liver, uh, you're going to see councilman bodies, pretty much our apoptotic bodies. Um, this is something where we're going to get to another infection that leads to uh, the opposite of this, but yellow fever pretty much leads to uh, death of your cells via the apoptotic pathway, not necrosis, but uh, apoptosis. And um, the kind of way to remember this, uh, so the region of the liver, if you can remember back to your histology, you have different lobules, and uh, the lobules are divided into zone one, two, and three, um, as far as like the functional uh, lobule uh, of the hepatocyte or the of the liver. And so uh, zone two, the, the only thing that we kind of uh, want to remember and think of that happens in zone two, because it's an intermediate level it's, um, region, it's not associated with metabolism or with kind of the first uh, area of the liver that gets blood or anything that has toxins. So this is zone two, it's kind of intermediate zone. And so a nice way to remember that this uh, zone two is affected by yellow fever is you put the two for Roman numeral and that is yellow fever with two um, uh, L's look like Roman numerals. So that's how you can remember that this affects zone two. So symptoms pretty much uh, it takes about a week for incubation after you get bit. Um, and there's kind of ab abrupt fever, myalgia, prostration. So this person wants to lay on their belly. They feel ill, uh, severely ill to the point where they have to lay on their belly in order to feel better. Um, usually resolves after a few days. Um, it's self-limiting. However, sometimes it can get uh, pretty bad and become a severe case. And that can be uh, not only just fever, but jaundice you can see, such as uh, this uh, very shocked man with jaundice up here. Um, or uh, you can also see presentation of black vomitus. So you can have a rupture in your, your GI tract and have black vomitus, uh, which is obviously in this picture. And I put them together so you can see like this weird looking face. Um, and it also can involve your kidneys, uh, could cause kidney, uh, kidney failure and such like that. Um, and then fatality if, if left untreated or no fluids and stuff like that. And that could lead to cytokine storm, shock and uh, organ failure. So diagnosis, as most uh, virus, viral infections, we need to do serology. You can also do PCR for this as well. Uh, treatment, uh, there is a live attenuated vaccine for this. Um, and that's uh, actually um, not widely used, but uh, you, you still have access to that in the United States. So next is uh, our dengue or our dengue virus. Uh, the transmission for this is the 80s uh, species of mosquitoes or 80s aegyptii. Uh, the virus is a flavivirus, single-stranded RNA positive. It's enveloped. A lot of our um, viral things that we're going to be talking about are flaviviruses today. Um, so the symptoms, pretty much uh, you just get a general um, high fever, uh, headache, uh, nausea, vomiting. Uh, one of the key features that you find uh, in this infection, and this is only in a few uh, different infections, but pain behind the eyes or retroorbital uh, pain. This is something that kind of gets you down to a couple, only a few differentials uh, on your differential diagnosis list. And this is one of them for dengue. Um, and so pretty much uh, once you uh, have this infection, you'll have lifelong immunity against that particular serotype. There's multiple of them. And uh, the, the problem, however, is you don't want to get dengue with another type of serotype of this uh, inf infection. Why? Is because uh, this can lead to immune-mediated antibody enhancement. You talked about this in the basics of virology. Um, it is pretty high yield still for this infection. Why? Is because it leads to um, the complication of this infection, which we'll get to in just a second. Other things that come along with this, so not only just high fever and headache, nausea, vomiting, um, pain behind the eyes, but also you have this, what is known as 
uh, break bone fever, so muscle and joint pain together. It's quite severe. The joint pain isn't as bad as chikungunya, um, and it doesn't last as long, but it is very severe as far as the muscle aches. Um, and uh, they do, it, it's very short-lived uh, severe pain. Um, and then you can also have a rash with this guy. Usually you don't see that in uh, some of the other guys, so that's something you, know, you want to be looking for in this as well. So severe pain, high fever, pain behind the eyes, uh, truncal rash, that's pretty much your, your dengue fever right there. Now a complication of this, say if you have this immune-mediated immune antibody enhancement, um, then you can lead to what is known as dengue hemorrhagic fever. So this is where you have serial abdominal pain, vomiting, bleeding gums, conjunctival hemorrhage. So this is uh, actually what you can see here uh, up in this picture. This is conjunctival hemorrhage. Um, you can have fatigue, uh, respiratory distress, and usually these last about uh, about a week and about that week's time that comes upon here uh, you can have severe hemorrhage to the point where you actually your metabolism stops and your body temperature drops from a high fever uh, down below 38 and all of a sudden and this is actually very dangerous this is a sign of uh, severe kind of internal bleeding damage and so you want to be taking care of that as quickly as possible and fixing whatever it is and getting them their fluids and getting their blood pressure back up um, and trying to promote their temperature to stay within a normal range. And if not, uh, this can be very lethal and that's very problematic. So now to our, on to our uh, next infection, which is chikungunya. Uh, chikungunya is found in Asia, Africa, some of the Americas, and uh, this is something you want to be looking out in questions for the Caribbean. Uh, they like being a little bit kind and giving you that in stems uh, to help you uh, pinpoint some of the infections. Again, uh, uh, 80s mosquitoes um, and the virus, uh, however, is not a flavivirus as we talked about. This is a toga or alpha virus. Single stranded RNA, same thing as a flavivirus and it's enveloped as just another type of virus. Uh, so pathogenesis from this, you get bit and uh, what happens is this virus replicates in fibroblasts first and then eventually it makes its way into the bloodstream and it spreads and, and affects muscles and joints especially and skin. Uh, it can also infect the spleen and liver and that leads to uh, like this inflammatory response which is like severe waxing and waning arthralgia and fever um, and this is one of the key features and that's why I highlighted this in yellow severe waxing and waning so severe pain it's in the joints and then it goes away and then it comes back and then it goes away and then it comes back and then it goes away and then it comes back and it's just this horrible arthralgia and this could go on for months to almost up to a couple years and so uh, this is something you need to be uh, helping out your patients giving them appropriate pain meds when needed and also protecting their GI tract when you're giving those pain meds such as uh, NSAIDs or stuff, stuff like that. Um, and then uh, symptoms pretty much present after the bite uh, usually about uh, a few days um, from four to eight days after. So next is our Zika virus, and uh, this has been making the news, uh, at least a few years ago, it started making the news a little bit more um, than, uh, well, I guess we had hoped. So this is, a, again, a flavivirus, a single-stranded RNA, positive sense, and it's enveloped. And uh, it's transmitted again from the 80s uh, uh, mosquito. Uh, but however, this is one that is also that can be transmitted sexually. And so this is a little bit different than the, the three we just had covered. Um, and so this is something you want to be looking out for uh, in patients that might have this as well. Um, so pathogenesis pretty much it binds and fuses to e-glycoproteins on cells. And that's uh, such as your epidermal keratinocytes. And uh, this can cause like bleeding and stuff like that. Um, uh, not really bleeding, but bleeding under the skin, which can lead to uh, a presentation of a rash, which you can see. It also infects dendritic cells and developing neurons. And this is where it comes into problematic. And we'll be talking about that in just a second. It also causes joint pain. Um, and it's less extensive to uh, chikungunya. So if somebody has severe, long-lasting joint pain, I would be more jumping over to chikungunya rather than my Zika virus. However, if this person has conjunctivitis along with this joint pain, muscle, fever, aches, um, this is more like this person has a viral infection. It's not severe joint pains. They're not hemorrhagic, so it's not really dengue, and they're not having a chest rash or something like that, and they're not having retroorbital pain. However, if they're having conjunctivitis, then I'm like, hmm, maybe I should throw in Zika in my differential. And you might be right, actually, at diagnosing that patient. So complications from this, uh, like other infections we've come across uh, throughout multiple of these modules, uh, Guillain-Barre syndrome can come from this. Remember, this is ascending paralysis. Now, if you can think of what other things can cause this, 
you want to pause that video and give yourself 10 seconds to think about them, we can do that. However, I'm going to tell you them right now. So some of the ones that we have covered so far are influenza and campylobacter. Campylobacter is actually the most common to lead to Guillain-Barre. Uh, remember that causes bloody and uh, inflammatory diarrhea, and that's in your GI module. If you don't remember that, refer back to uh, my video on GI, and uh, that should be a, a good enough reminder for, for that guy. Other things on the more rare side that can cause a CMV and Epstein-Barr virus, we're going to be covering those a little bit later today. I won't be mentioning it there that they ca cause Guillain-Barre. This is the only time I'm going to mention that here, um, but they can cause it as well. Um, back in the respiratory infections, uh, we also talked about um, that influenza, which I mentioned, and mycoplasma pneumonia actually can cause this as well. And then lastly, uh, one big thing is actually HIV has been also associated with neurological symptoms. Not only lymphomas in the brain and uh, syncytia, but it also can cause Guillain-Barre. So that's uh, more on a rare account. Um, but other things that come complicated this and something more on the side of uh, the news. Uh, the news has been talking about this uh, micro scold babies known as micro encephaly, which is small, smooth brain. Um, and you can actually see this small, smooth brain in this patient up here. And they actually have dilated ventricles, as you can see uh, on these MRIs. And um, pretty much what happens is if the mo uh, mother that has this baby um, gets infected with Zika, it can cross across the placenta. This is a, a torch infection. And uh, remember that this in, uh, de develops um, and, and grows within uh, developing neurons, and so that could cause a lot of problems during the development. However, there are two types. There's African type and Asian lineage of Zika virus, and specifically only the Asian lineage of Zika can actually cause this infection. And I want you to maybe circle this if you printed these notes. This is a high yield point for this that for um, microlithencephaly or microcephaly, um, the Asian lineage for Zika is the, the only one that does that. The African type is not. Um, this can cause a lot of developmental delays and seizures, uh, vision and hearing loss, and feeding difficulty uh, in infants. So now on to the vector carrier bacterial and parasitic infections. Uh, we're going to be talking a lot about uh, tick-borne infections and stuff like that. So let's go ahead and get into that. So the first uh, that we're going to get to in this section is uh, known as Lyme disease. Uh, we did cover this a little bit when we got to skin, so I'm going to kind of recap real quickly on what that is. Um, however, we need to know a little bit more details now that you're in the multi-systems. So this is uh, caused from Borrelia burgdorferi, um, and the pathogenesis from this uh, pretty much there's an initial bite from uh, different ticks, and this is kind of associated where are you in the United States as far as uh, epidemiology goes to what tick is most likely carrying it. And so if you're in the scapula of the United States, which is this kind of uh, sharp point up here or northeast United States, uh, you have Ixodes scapularis. Oh, wow, isn't that amazing how that works? And I actually put up a little scapula over here just to remind you that this is the scapula of the United States, and uh, that is your Ixodes scapularis. Um, uh, another guy over here on the western side is right next to the Pacific Ocean, and so we're going to call this Ixodes pacificus. Um, these are your deer ticks or your black-legged tick, and I have a picture of it up here. Uh, pretty much what you need to do uh, is memorize what these pictures of these ticks look like, and uh, pretty much it's really nice. This guy has a smooth little round black or brown kind of shield on his back and he's like light brown for the rest of uh, his body. So it's round, it's smooth, it doesn't have any designs really on it. Um, that is your deer tick or black-legged tick. Um, the deer tick is a little bit browner on the legs and the, uh, the black-legged tick obviously has black legs. Um, but remember, this is the most important. It's nice to know the names and recognize at least the genus of the uh, tick that carries Lyme disease, but it's not just the tick, but what stage of the tick that causes the disease and it's most likely the nymph stage. So we have this uh, kind of development of our ticks, and these are this is an adult tick here in this picture, and uh, what happens is it makes little babies, and there's little babies, and they grow up, and they can actually latch on to animals and suck their blood, and then they develop into adult stage after a, a certain amount of time. And so these little babies that latch on and suck blood and, and grow from that, those nutrients, these are known as nymphs. They're little tiny things, they don't look anything like 
like here. Um, they're really creepy looking. You can actually Google them. But remember, the nymph stage is so small, you don't even notice it on your skin. So it can stay on there for a couple days even. You not, might not even notice it. And if it stays on there for longer than about 36 hours, that's enough time for it to transmit the tick. If it's on there for a couple hours, it won't transmit uh, the, the Lyme disease, um, Borrelia, into, into the skin. It actually has to be latched on for about 36 hours. Um, and that's really important that you know that it is the nymph stage, okay? Um, what is this organism? So it's gram-negative spirochete, and it enters through the skin. Um, and this can be uh, through vertical, vertical transmission as far as the ticks go. And so the adults uh, can actually give it to the nymph or baby, so it doesn't actually like have to go from a tick to a host and then back to a tick, and then to another host, and then back to a tick, right? It uh, actually just goes from the adult to the baby nymph, um, and uh, that is through vertical transmission. Um, and remember, your Ixodes deer tick uh, is also the vector for anaplasma, which we'll be discussing, and uh, Babesia is a protozoal infection we won't be talking uh, about in this module. Uh, but just to know that those two are carried from there. This actually came up on a test. Uh, we don't learn anything about the organism, um, and uh, it just kind of was like, what else does this tick carry? And anaplasma was not a choice, so I'll be looking out for Babesia. You can do a couple pictures uh, on Google, and, and that should uh, be, be good enough. First aid might have a couple pieces of information, but it's uh, most likely just basics on, oh, it's carried from Exodes deer tick. Um, so as far as the symptoms for this, um, Remember that this is a, a spirochete, and so it kind of buries into the skin, and then it can move via its endoflagellum. Uh, this has a, a linear plasmid, and that's how it kind of creates all of its proteins and everything like that, so it can function properly. So the first stage, actually, once you get bitten from this, and it stays on there for 35 hours, and then it may fall off or something like that, if it transmits uh, Borrelia into the skin, then it starts migrating outward in this ring formation, kind of, uh, you know, spiraling ch -ch 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 out. Um, and it forms this ring uh, type skin lesion. This is known as erythema chronicum migrans, or ECM. It's also known as your bull's eye rash, and it's slowly expanding. It could be just, it could just look like this in the early stages, and then once it broadens and widens out, you'll have a zone of clearing uh, in the middle here uh, between the zones of erythema. And so that's how you know it's kind of migrating outwards. And then once the, the skin rash goes away, if we don't treat it or don't catch it in time, uh, then there's other things that can come from this. So stage two, actually you can have five, uh, fever and then it can start to make its way into the CNS. And so when it makes its way into the CNS, it causes problems. And this can cause facial palsy, known as Bell's palsy. I'm sure you remember that from anatomy. So it's kind of one-sided, entire facial nerve paralysis. So your face is all drooping, the person's drooling, or something like that. Um, that's a kind of way to remember that that is uh, Bell's palsy and facial nerve is involved. Uh, it can also involve your cardiac uh, muscle. And this can cause a heart block in, in there, such as a third degree heart block. Um, and so that's something we need to be careful with as well, um, because that could lead to arrhythmias and such like that. And actually, the person could die from that. So it's something we need to be uh, keep an eye on. Uh, also, it can cause uh, myalgias and arthritis that kind of migrate and move all over the place. Remember, this is a migratory spirochete, so it moves all over the place. So obviously, if we have arthritis associated with Lyme disease, it's going to be migrating all over the place. However, if we leave it for even longer than stage two and it progresses to stage three, it's going to be chronic joint pains, a lot of joint pains, something that you can't even really get rid of, even if you treat uh, the infection itself. Also can lead to meningeal irrit irritation like meningitis, encephalitis, um, and you will be getting to more of that information in your CNS section actually coming up this next week. Um, and I will be posting a video on that as well. So diagnosis, pretty much an enzyme amino assay for antibodies, uh, and then to confirm with a Western blot. And a, a way to remember this, uh, it actually was a good mnemonic from first aid. I actually liked it pretty, uh, it was pretty good. And so this is uh, when you throw a key lime pie in the face, right? And so you spell out face, so facial nerve palsy. So that's that Bell palsy. But however, this is interesting. It's not just Bell's palsy on one side, it's actually Bell's palsy on bilateral, which makes sense because Bell's palsy, we're usually thinking of an injury to face facial nerve. So it's usually, how common do you think someone gets injured bilaterally on their facial nerve? Not really. However, if you have an infection that's spreading all over your whole body, it makes sense that it more likely can be bilateral. And so this is something, uh, a key feature that, that you should know for boards. Uh, I'm not sure about for micro, uh, but as far as boards, this is a good thing to come back and remember, maybe write down in your first aid. So when you're studying fifth term or for your step, you'll have that in there and you'll know that uh, that is important. 
and it also causes arthritis, which is the A, cardiac block for C, and erythema migraines, which is that stage one. So now on to Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever. This is actually one of my favorite uh, guys. It's actually pretty cool. Um, so the transmission uh, is of this organism, the organism known as is Rickettsi Rickettsi, um, and uh, it's transmitted from the Rocky Mountain Wood Tick, uh, which is pretty cool because it's actually Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever carried by the Rocky Mountain Wood Tick. Um, however, they don't really like giving you uh, that tick name, the common one. They actually like asking you the genus and species. So these are known as your Demacenters, uh, and, uh, such as Andersoni and Variabilis. Um, and that is uh, the, these ticks up here. Uh, this tick is actually your Anso uh, Andersoni, uh, but the variabilis actually looks a lot like this. So, um, uh, and I'll be emphasizing what that looks like in just a second. So uh, also it's carried from your brown dog tick, uh, which is Ribocephalus sanguinis. Um, and that is this guy. It's this really ugly, kind of basic, boring uh, tick over here. So if you look at that tick and you just go, ugh, look how boring that is. There's no cool, round, smooth shield on it. And there's no sick shield over here on this guy. That's probably my Rhizocephalus sanguinis. And that is uh, carrying your Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever. But now I want to kind of point out this Dermacenter. So the Dermacenters actually have this really cool looking shield. So if I see this cool shield, see these like little designs, almost has like a face. Um, and it's got little points or whatever here. It actually looks sort of like a transformer's face. So that's kind of why I put this guy down here, um, is that looks like uh, the shield on the back of these guys. So remember back here um, with this tick, it's very smooth, it's just a round shield, and then very smooth and round. It's almost like a, a moon, you know, like an eclipse tick, right? Where this guy has that eclipse sort of, but it's kind of jagged and it's got this cool shield like uh, Transformers face on it. So that is your uh, Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever uh, that is carried from your Dermacenter Andersoni and Dermacenter Variabalis tick. So where do you find this infection? Uh, despite contrary uh, understanding, if I were to tell my family, hey, Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever, where do you think that is? They would probably say, probably in the Rocky Mountains. But they would be wrong because usually you're going to find this in places like Georgia, Oklahoma, Ar uh, Arkansas, Tennessee, and the most uh, highest prevalence of this is in North Carolina, which most of these states are actually on the southeast United States. And um, I've actually emphasized that here, and this is dark red states here um, in, in this picture. I know a lot of people are not from the United States and might not know geography in the United States. And if they put up a picture here or talk about a state over here, uh, it's not going to ring a bell. And, uh, the, you know, I don't want to have you spending all your time studying states of the United States and their capitals and all this geography while you're in medical school. Medical school is hard. There's a lot of stuff to me memorize. So if you can just remember generally Southeast United States, they will provide that in the stem, saying it's in the southeast United States, and that might be talking about Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever. However, you can't just say it's Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever, spotted fever because of the southeast United States. Remember, there's tons of worms and all those things over there. So what is the pathogenesis and condition that this comes upon? So pretty much what happens once you get infected, uh, you've bitten with this tick, um, and it stays on there for a while and transmits this uh, organism into you. Um, it infects endothelial cells and causes RBC leakage and damage of vessels. And so this can lead to that rash or petechia, which you can see in this little uh, kid's hand over here. Uh, and this is going to lead to a lymphocytic response. Why? Because these are intracellular parasites. Um, and so obviously lymphocytes like your T, uh, CD8, positive T cells are going to be the ones that are responding to kill the endothelial cells that are infected with, with these uh, bacteria. Um, and conditions, um, uh, so this causes Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever, obviously. And remember uh, from our skin, we talked about that this is centripetal, uh, so it goes to the trunk. And uh, so it's uh, rickettsia on the wrist, so it starts in the wrist, goes to the trunk. And then from the trunk, it eventually makes its way onto the palms and soles. Remember, there's only a few infections that we need to, to remember. It spells out CAR, which is uh, Coxsackie A, um, C, uh, I'm sorry, uh, that would be an R for this guy, Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever, and S for syphilis. Those are the guys that have palms and soles infections uh, that you should be able to remember. Causes a classic triad of headache, fever, and rash. Uh, sometimes it can have abdominal pain and muscle pain, um, and something that you want to be watching out for is hyponatremia, so be monitoring those patients 
um, electrolytes uh, to be able to, to provide those for him because uh, or him or her uh, because that is uh, something we need to be monitoring as doctors. So diagnosis uh, is PCR and that is the best for this guy um, and then followed by ELISA or enzyme amino assay. What we used to do, actually, we don't use it much anymore. This is known as your wheel Felix test. Pretty much we take Proteus, which uh, you did come upon when we uh, talked about uh, urinary tract infections as a bacterial. And so we take the antigen from that guy um, and we attach it onto beads. And then uh, we kind of throw this person's serum into those and it can cause agglutination of those beads. And that kind of says, oh, we have a positive Rocky Mountain spotted fever. Uh, there's a lot of false positives on that test. And so uh, we have to be very careful at saying that this is a, a complete confirmation of diagnosis. So now on to ehrlichiosis and anaplasmosis. So this is kind of a similar slide as uh, I did present in skin. Um, and so I'm going to kind of go through this pretty quickly. But I did add in those tick pictures uh, just to remind you uh, what those guys are for. So uh, ehrlichia uh, is going to be caused from ehrlichi Allergia chaffinsis and Ewingi. So these are gram-negative intracellular uh, parasites and uh, pretty much what it causes is fever, malaise. Remember conjunctivitis is more common with this guy um, than it is anaplasmosis. Headache, myalgia, confusion, um, and uh, those are, are more common, uh, a rash is more common uh, than anaplasmosis for Ehrlichia. So it, it's kind of hard with uh, the multi-systems diseases because they all seem to be presenting with a lot of the same symptoms, but there's really defining features. So you just kind of have to step back when you read a stem. And when you read it, it just says, this person has headache, myalgias, confusion, fever, and malaise. This person has an infection, which is nice, right? And then you say, what are the risk factors of this person getting something that could lead to these symptoms, right? And that if it's something like, oh, they work outside, or, oh, they went up to the Northeast United States, some epidemiology or um, risk factors such as going outside, any of these risk factors for these infections are super high yield of getting you towards your diagnosis. It's going to help you pick out this over something else. Um, and in addition to some of the, the more specific things. So uh, remember this is uh, carried from your Lone Star tick. So I put a picture over here. It literally has a Lone Star on its back. So you can't mess this up with anybody else. Literally Ehrlichia, Lone Star. And remember that this guy is gonna have mulberry-like inclusions or marulae inside monocytes. And I actually added onto this mnemonic. So remember Megaberry. So monocytes uh, in Ehrlichia, so M-E, monocytes, in Ehrlichia and mono of monocytes is actually means one, right? Mono uh, means one, and that's like a lone star or a single star or one star. So the lone star tick is the one that carries um, uh, the Ehrlichia chaffinsis. This is Amblyoma americanum. So the lone star, you know, lone star is actually the the state flag or uh, one of the flags in in Texas. Actually, it's the lone star state. Texas is the lone star state, and it's real American. You know, if you down on the south, down there in Texas, um, they're really, really southern, and uh, they got their country music and everything like that. Uh, so remember that they're very American. Um, ha, 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 Lone Star Tech. Okay. Next is your Anaplasma phagocytophyllum. Uh, this is gram negative as well, intracellular. Causes very similar symptoms, uh, chills and confusion. Usually the rare is, uh, uh, or the rash is more rare. Um, however, remember as we mentioned before, this is carried from your Exodes tick. And if you're up in the scapula of the United States or the, the Northeast, that's your scapularis. Or if you're on the Western coast near the Pacific Ocean, your Ixodes pacificus. And those are associated Western and black-legged ticks. And uh, remember, Marole for this guy is going to be in your neutrophils um, and granulocytes. And so uh, your uh, granulocytes are for anaplasmosis, and that is your mega berry. And here is the tick uh, of your Ixodes tick. Remember, smooth round, almost like uh, an eclipse-like tick. And here's your Marule, uh in the pictures in the top. So now on to Leishmaniasis. Uh, we did talk about this as well in skin. Um, it is making its way back. So the organism is uh, Leishmania tropica, Leishmania mexicana, Leishmania brasiliensis, uh, and Leishmania donovani, which is the one that causes the calazar. And that's the one we're going to be mainly emphasizing today. So transmission is from your phlebotomist or lutsomaya sand flies. And remember, uh, the flies are on a leash in a desert. You know, you're sitting in the desert and you're like, hmm, 
this is weird. Why am I in a desert? And then you look around, there's these giant le uh, flies, and they're on leashes. And you're like, wow, this is weird. It's like a leash mania. <laughs> leash mania. So these are your sand flies in the desert. So the disease uh, is going to be cause, uh, causing you cutaneous lesions. It's the most common, like those skin sores. Uh, mucocutaneous, which just uh, kind of in includes uh, some of the mucous uh, membranes and mucus disfiguring lesions. And then the visceral uh, is going to be known as your uh, calazar, that in, uh, infects your spleen and liver and bone marrow. Um, and then when you give treatment to these patients, it actually causes granulomas on the skin, uh, especially with uh, post calazar. And uh, they're like depigmented, so they're like white kind of lesions on the skin, and then the, the granulomas are found uh, under them. So diagnosis for this are, uh, is a, ma uh, a mastigotes inside the macrophages, which you can see up in this top right picture up here. You see these little like, uh, they look like little bees uh, inside your macrophages. Um, but remember, uh, look at the picture right now if in your first aid for histoplasmosis. Uh, you want to be able to differentiate those two based on that picture. Don't, don't uh, make that uh, confusing for you. Make sure to organize that in, in your mind and uh, visual memory. And uh, you can also see trophozoites, and they, remember these look like avocados with tails, so I have my little avocado down here with this little tail, and uh, we can see those on um, microscopy as well. So treatment for this is amphotericin B, which is uh, usually a commonly used antifungal, uh, especially for like systemic uh, fungal infections. Um, and uh, in addition, sodium stiboglucanase. So this is actually, I think, the only infection that we use this antibiotic um, for. So uh, maybe uh, try to remember that when you get to uh, farm. Uh, it, it might help you a little bit to uh, remember that leishmania is one of the only places that you see that. So now on to American trypanosomiasis. Uh, this is uh, known as Chagas disease. Uh, it's caused from uh, Trypanosoma cruzii. And uh, the transmission is through uh, the Reduvid bug, also known as the kissing bug. And uh, why we call it the kissing bug is because it gives a non-painful bite near the mouth or eyes during the night. Um, and it's also like a kiss. And uh, this is where uh, once it bites, it actually defecates in the wound, which is totally normal. Actually, it's not at all. So uh, epidemiology is you're going to find it in Latin America. And I want to make a shout out for this mnemonic. Uh, this came from Ruthie Tam, my friend uh, in term five. And um, uh, I love this mnemonic. It actually helps a lot for uh, questions that come up. And so this is uh, Shaga's The Latin Lover, is cruising in his red VW bug, kissing all the ladies. So here he is down here. And uh, so it's Chagas disease, which we mentioned here. Um, it's found in Latin America. It is caused from Trypanosoma cruzii. And it is carried by the Redu VW bug, or Redu big bug. And uh, it is known as the kissing bug as well. Remember, this is at night. It is non-painful. Uh, and that's how you get this. And so um, the, the acute phase of this disease uh, appears about two months after the initial infection uh, or bite. Uh, because the parasites take a little while to develop and grow in the blood. Uh, they can cause skin lesions and purple swellings all over the eyelid. And this is known as Romagna sign. And uh, you can actually find this down here in this picture. Um, and remember, this uh, sort of looks like calabar lesions, but this is just of the eyelid. Calabar lesions were found in Loa Loa or Loa Loiasis. And uh, that's as it migrates around on the skin and your arm and leg or wherever it is. And then it makes its way up to the eye. Um, but this is just in the eye, and this is just of the eyelid swellings, uh, and they're, they're kind of purple in color. And uh, this is known as Romagna sign, and that's why I made them a little bit purple. And uh, you can also see fever, headache, pallor, muscle pain, and chest pain with this. Um, in the chronic stage of the, this, if left untreated, um, the cardiac disorders can come from this, such as dilated, and I want to emphasize this word right here, dilated cardiomyopathy, and cardiac arrhythmias, and heart failure can come from that. GI disorders such as esophag esophagus, which is uh, going to be causing achalasia. And I'm sure in pathology and GI, you've came across causes of achalasia and Chagas disease came up. Uh, that is this guy right here, which causes dilatation above where that esophagus is not opening, where that achalasia is. So dilated cardiomyopathy, dilatation of the esophagus and lower esophageal sphincter, and uh, are above the lower esophageal sphincter and colon dilatation known as megacolon 
So dilated cardiomyopathy, dilated esophagus, and dilated colon, known as megacolon. Uh, so this is your dilating disease. So keep that in mind. Uh, this is very high yield for this uh, infection. Diagnosis, microscopy, and uh, what you wanna look for is actually, uh, here's our little trypanosome out here, and it actually has this little undulating membrane. It's like a little fin, almost. Almost looks like, yeah, he almost has a little fin here. See, on this, this guy? And uh, that's how you can kind of tell, okay, I'm looking at tr uh, trypanosoma. However, to differentiate this from our next guy, which is African trypanosomiasis, is this right here. So um, this is known as your kinetoplast. And pretty much what this is, is uh, my, uh, mitochondrial DNA kind of hooked together with some ribosomes. And uh, this is uh, uh, gonna be found at the end of the parasite or the, like the anterior portion of the parasite up here. And uh, how to differentiate this from your African one is this one actually has a large, and you know how Americans are, yeah, guns blazing loud and everything, you know, big obnoxious guys. Uh, you know, got all the big guns in the army and navy and crazy, just huge. You know, we have a little bit of cockiness, I guess, when it comes to that. So that is where we get a, our large kinetoplast, and so uh, that's how you kind of differentiate these. And uh, you you won't be able to mistake that when you see these pictures. So uh, when I point it out on the next slide, and uh, pretty much what we need to do is do a blood smear, and we can we can diagnose this guy. So look for large kinetoplast in the anterior portion of this. If you see, if you can actually like go, hey, that looks like a large kinetoplast, or like that looks like a kinetoplast, even that you can spot it, that's most likely American trypanosomiasis. So now on to African trypanosomiasis. Let me emphasize the picture right now before we get into what this is. This is caused from trypanosoma brucei. And so here's our little um, trypanosomas down here, right? Our little uh, uh, trypanosomiasis. Uh, and uh, this guy, do you even see the kinetoplast? Yeah, this little, little tiny thing right here. So that's this little, 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 little tiny kinetoplast. And that's how we differentiate the two. Because this guy has a very large one. It's huge. Even, I mean, we're not that much higher in magnification. But this guy, you can barely see it. It's just this little tiny thing. Um, and that is your African trypanosomiasis. Common name for this disease, I'm sure you've heard of it, is known as African sleeping sickness. Um, I've heard this on the news since I was a kid and stuff like that. Um, it is uh, kind of rampant in Africa, obviously, uh, as by its name. So the most common uh, trypanosoma that causes this is brucei, also reduzense and gambiense. They're kind of found in different areas, some in Latin America as well. So careful with that crossover. If you go to Latin America, you could have either one. So you want to look for that kinetoplast. Uh, difference. So transmission is uh, the tsetse fly. Um, it's painful bite, and this is during the day, which is kind of opposite of that red big, nice, uh, painless bite from that kissing bug in Chagas disease. So pathogenesis, first it spreads to the lymph tissues and then reproduces, and then it makes its way into the blood. This guy can invade the brain and the spinal cord and produces a toxin which causes the symptoms that we see in African sleeping sickness, such as lethargy and coma, which is uh, sleep disturbance to the point where it's severe sleep disturbance when you're unconscious in a coma. And then that could lead to death. And this is problematic and this is why we need to treat patients as quickly as possible before they show these symptoms. Microscopy, we're going to look for those trypomastigotes. Um, remember, this is known as a trypomastigote, um, and it's nice because it's called uh, trypan trypanosomiasis, um, and it's trypomastigotes. Uh, remember, undulating membrane gives it away. You can kind of see the little fins on there, uh, but the tiny kinetoplast. Treatment for this is suramin. Now on to our non-vector parasitic infections, uh, and that affect multiple organ systems. On to our schistosomiasis and echinococcus uh, species. So first is our schistosomiasis. Uh, this guy is actually pretty cool and it kind of integrates with some of your pathology you're going to be coming across if you haven't already. Um, so the organisms that cause this, there's actually three and you actually need to know all three. Uh, this is very high yield to know all three, but I have uh, good ways to remember each of them. Um, so uh, don't worry uh, about going, oh, how do I don't remember Mansoni or Hematobium or Japonicum, right? So uh, I separated the brown ones because they're more associated with brown poop, so they're causing an infection in the GI system, where hematobium is more of the yellow guy, and so he's more associated with urine in the GU system, and uh, japonicum as well in the GI, and that's why it's brown. So the disease, uh, this is also known as snail fever or katayama fever. Um, the ova, these guys have spines on them. I'll be showing you those in, in just a second. Um, 
and uh, they enter the snail in fresh water and hatch into uh, cercariae, and then they release into the water uh, in the snails. And then uh, what they do is they actually penetrate our human skin as we're swimming around, splashing around in the water. Um, and what they, how they actually do that, they don't just like bite and go through the bite. And uh, they actually secrete this like flesh-eating enzymes, and they kind of open up holes in our skin and that allows them to, to enter and it's usually around hair follicles that they do this you can actually watch on youtube uh just type in trypanosomiasis and there's this like uh parasites inside of me like video or something like that um it's kind of gross uh or monsters inside me i think video so uh when it enters uh develops into worms in the blood vessels in the blood vessels and mates with one another there's a male and there's a female type and they mate with one another and then they produce a lot of eggs and spit those out in the blood and uh, those eggs, which we will be seeing in just a second, um, they enter the appropriate outlet G GI or GU system as we were talking about with these guys. So complications kind of depend on where they go. So for uh, uh, schistosomiasis or schistosoma hematobium, um, this is the guy that gets stuck in the bladder wall and, um, and, uh, and, and the ureter as well. And this can cause inflammation response and it could be like chronic inflammation, which could lead to obstruction of the bladder and that leads to you know polyps and all that stuff. But uh, most commonly, um, as far as uh, strange pathology that occurs after this is known as squamous cell carcinoma of the bladder. So usually you have your urogenital carcinoma that's associated with like smoking and stuff like that. And then you can have very rare cases like your adenocarcinoma at the dome of the bladder. This is caused from your uracus, uh, your remnants of your embry uh, embryogenesis. And then you have squamous cell, which is caused from schistosomiasis. Other things that can cause squamous cells, but this is one that's very particular and very strange. So they like asking about it. Um, that is squamous cell carcinoma of the bladder. And that can cause obviously obstruction when the tumor grows and hydronephrosis, as you talked about in pathology, I'm sure. This guy also can infect pulmonary um, and cause like, you know, a chronic cough and stuff like that, eosinophilic cough, but uh, usually a less common. Uh, other things are like pulmonary hypertension, which can lead to like right-sided heart failure. So um, Schistosoma mansoni and japonicum, um, these guys actually can be trapped in mesenteric veins or as opposed to the kidneys, like in the hematobium, and uh, such as the portal veins and branches, and uh, these can cause peri uh, ovular granulomas or periportal fibrosis in the liver, and uh, this is actually shown in, in this uh, kid over here. Um, this is actually the adult worms that are found in the blood. Uh, they're kind of creepy. Um, but this is, a, this is a kid that has um, actually periportal fibrosis of his liver, an enlargement of his liver, and uh, this is a problem in Africa, and uh, this is something we need to be taking care of uh, and treating those. Uh, hopefully, a, a lot of us as doctors, we, we take that initiative uh, to go out on, on missions trips to, to help kids, and that we can bring some uh, treatments for, for things like this. Um, this this kid, if left untreated, would go into uh, liver failure and die probably by the time uh, he's in his early teens. And so that's something we need to be um, to hopefully be able to, to help out with that. Um, and remember, hepatosplenomegaly comes from that, portal hypertension, uh, varices, and hematemesis, and that can lead to uh, the patient's death. So diagnosis, pretty much we want to look for eggs in urine or feces, kind of depending on what it was. Remember, urine for hematobia and feces for the other two. So here is uh, kind of a way that uh, actually someone from my class, I don't know who it was, but um, they actually uh, drew up this thing and I, um, uh, I thought it was really, really creative on a way to remember which one goes where as far as what they look like and description of them. So they're kind of associated with the spines. So we have our... Uh, hematobium, which is this guy in the middle. We have our japonicum, which is our round guy right here, and mansoni, which is has this lateral spine on it. So japonicum has a spine. You can't really see it because it's very, 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 very tiny. You won't be able to see it on here, so it's pretty much just associated with round. So I'm going to take hematobium first. So uh, the hematobium, he kind of remembered this by drawing a bladder, right? So it looks sort of like a bladder, and here's the little kidneys and stuff like this. So this is a way that uh, you have this terminal spine, or the end uh, of this egg spine, and that is your hematobium. I thought it was very, very creative. And then japonicum uh, is this round. It's like the Japanese flag. You know, it's a flag shape, and then it has the little circle dot, and that's your uh, Japanese flag. So japonicum is round like this, like the dot of Jap uh, Japan. And he's also pooping it out like little pellets, right? So he's got his little uh, japonicum. So that just reminds you this is your G. 
GI system. This is GU, and this is GI system. And then Mansoni, he's got this poop that literally, like, it looks like it's coming out, and then it's making this little puddle of poop, uh, which is kind of cool because it's literally, here's the pile of poop, and then this is the little driblets that are still coming out of his butt, and that is your lateral spine of Mansoni. And so that's, that's a pretty cool way of remembering um, that these guys uh, have to do with your uh, GI system and the mesenteric like veins and spleen and portal system and stuff like that has to do with that. I thought it was very creative. So now onto Echinococcus granulosus, um, and there's actually another Echinococcus we're going to be talking about as well. Uh, so uh, granulosus, actually, uh, the structure for this is multicellular segmented and proglottids, and you can actually see that uh, right up here in the, uh, this top picture. And... Uh, so with this guy up here, and it's got hooks and suckers on it, as you can see over here, and uh, these guys are hermaphrodites, uh, so they can actually mate with themselves, which is uh, kind of strange. And uh, epidemiology, so um, this is usually associated with sheep raising countries like Europe, Africa, Asia, Australia. Um, remember that this is associated with sheep for granulosis. Granulosis, sheep, sheep, granulosis. Um, disease, so the larvae are, they like form slow growing hydatid cysts. Uh, which are really gross, just bubbly cysts, and uh, they actually grow inside there. Um, and they contain the, the daughter cysts and eventually disintegrate uh, within the mother cyst, and that becomes a unilocular cyst. So that's why they call it granulosis, where the next one is multilocularis. This is unilocular, so it's like one granuloma, um, sort of. And uh, transmission, you ingest the eggs from the feces of dogs. So intermediate hosts are sheep, right? So sheep, uh, they're herding in all these areas, and then they have poop or whatever. Maybe they get eaten from dogs or canines, like uh, wolves and stuff like that. And those are the definitive hosts. If they get, they poop out stuff, and then we somehow get dog food, uh, dog poop in our in our food or something like that, then we ingest those, and we can get this guy. So that's why it's more rare in the United States, uh, except for some sheep raising areas, such as maybe Ohio or something like that. Um, and uh, where there's a lot of farm farmland. So pathogenesis, uh, there's mechanical tissue damage, pressure atrophy that can lead to immune damage. And then if we pop those cysts, it can lead to anaphylactic shock. And so here's the liver. And this is one of the common places you actually find the cysts is they, they float around the blood, they make their way um, by an ingestion, right? You ingest it, they get absorbed, make their way through the intestinal wall, make themselves into the portal system. And then that goes right to the liver. And so that's why we're gonna see cysts in the liver very commonly. Um, and so, um, you can see abdominal pain, hepatic mass with multiple cysts and biliary obstruction. You can see all these little cysts in here. It's kind of disgusting. Um, chest pain, cough. Sometimes these cysts can be in there. You can have hemoptysis. Um, and then uh, the problem, however, and this is actually where the high yield kind of questions come from. You can get to the diagnosis from the stem. This person has sheep on their land and they have dogs and then the dog ate the sheep or something and then we decided to eat their poop for no apparent reason. Actually, that's not usually what comes up in the stem, but for some reason this person has abdominal pain. We do MRI, they see cysts or they show you a picture of this and you go, oh, it looks like cysts in the liver. And they say, person goes, or a surgeon goes in to remove parts of the liver that have this stuff. What do they need to be careful of? Well, they need to be careful of rupturing these cysts because when you rupture it, it can cause anaphylactic shock and kill the person. So you have to be very careful with these. So what they actually do is they inject each of these cysts with like saline um, and either that or some sort of uh, like um, alkylating agent or something that's 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 damaging to um, these uh, cysts and they end up dying and then they can actually remove them easier without anaphylactic shock. So treatment, anything that has cysts in it, think of albendazole because you bend those little worms, which are these guys up, so up here, um, and, and in order to break them. You can also give mabendazole as well, but albendazole for cysts, and uh, that comes up again with uh, tinea solium with neurocystor cirrhosis. You actually treat with albendazole. So now onto the next echinococcus is multilocularis. Uh, it's smaller than granulosis, um, same life cycle and everything like we talked about. However, um, the end, end result is the daughter cells don't really uh, degrade. It actually makes, all, makes these multilocular cysts. So that's a, a key feature of this, which is nice because it's literally called multilocularis. Uh, so it makes it easier for you. So these can occur in Northern Hemisphere, like USA, Canada, Europe. Um, and usually uh, the intermediate host is a small rodents. Uh, and that's why you have a rodent up here, and you can see these wonderful cysts in its abdomen. Mmm, 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 nummy, nummy. Uh, definitive hosts are like foxes and dogs and wolves and coyotes and stuff like that. So again, that definitive host has to do with uh, your canids, right? Um, 
And then symptoms, pretty much liver, slow growing. Uh, same thing, those cysts that you're going to find in the abdominal cavity, abdominal pain, obstruction, liver cysts, lung cysts. And then uh, careful of that anaphylaxis, same, same reason. So now onto the infections inhaled, ingested, or contacted. Um, these guys are, are pretty high yield for, for this section. So tularemia, um, this is caused from Francisella tularensis. This is a gram-negative uh, small rod. You can actually see them up here. They almost don't even look like rods, um, but uh, they're very small. And they're gram-negative. And uh, the infectious dose for this is less than 100. Uh, the department likes asking about whenever there is some uh, high yield point about infectious dose. Remember, this is less than 100. It needs iron and cysteine in order to grow on auger. It's very particular and very needy, uh, like a little baby. And, um, and epidemiology, pretty much, uh, it's usually found in small wild animals, like in the south, southwest USA and midwest USA. Um, this is known as rabbit fever. You can also find it in beavers and deers and cats and dogs. Um, usually exposure in hunter, uh, hunting, rabbit drives, trapping, lab workers, vets, and farmers. And you're like, wait a second. Hold on, Clark. That gets a rabbit drive. Uh, this is actually a rabbit drive up here in this uh, kind of uh, uh, GIF video. So um, back in the 1930s, uh, so in 1929, we had on October 29th our stock market crash. This is known as Black Tuesday. And uh, that actually caused uh, our economy in the United States to drop drastically to the point where uh, the resources that were being used um, were kind of anything and all everything. Um, and uh, so people started really u utilizing the, the crops and everything found in areas such as Oklahoma and Kansas and stuff like that to the point where everything became dead. Like they literally ate everything because they didn't have money. The, every, a lot of people had their money in stocks and it was just gone. It got lost. That's why after that crash, it was so horrible. And this is known as the Great Depression, I'm sure you've heard of. And in areas in the middle, uh, middle of the United States, like Kansas, for example, um, after destroying the environment from eating all the crops and everything that were growing there or, and not watering them and not spending uh, that money on irrigation and all that sort of stuff, um, everything kind of died and it became what is known as the Dust Bowl. So it actually was almost like a large, giant, dusty storm that occurred occurred there for a long amount of time and people actually had to leave the area because it was so bad. Well, one thing that came from this um, was a lot of uh, the predators they actually killed, uh, such as wolves and stuff like that. Uh, they actually killed and ate. And so what left was tons and tons of rabbits. And actually what is in this picture are rabbits. There's like hundreds of thousands of rabbits in fields. And so they're like, well, we have so many rabbits. Why don't we round them up? And then we can go in there and we can club them. You can see some of the people in the background like with clubs and they're uh, killing all these little rabbits and uh, they actually would eat them. And so um, this is where it kind of comes into play is tularemia is transmitted often more in rabbits. And so just imagine if tularemia was uh, found in this place right here. Gosh, all these people would be dead. It would be a uh, quite brutal infection that would kill all these people. So I uh, just wanted to bring up uh, that and hopefully it sticks in your mind that this is known as tularemia or rabbit fever caused from Francisella tularensis. And a little bit of history in there too. It's kind of cool. So uh, other things that can carry this, way more on the rare account. Usually they don't like asking this, but ticks can carry it like the American dog tick, wood tick, lone star tick, and deer fly. So pretty much everything can carry this. Um, but they like rabbits uh, for some reason. She did share uh, in our lecture kind of a little story about this guy kind of mowing lawns at this old folks home or something like that. And I guess a bunch of rabbits like died under the, the grass in this place. And so it was a bunch of dead grass. And uh, so when this guy was mowing all the grass, it was like kicking up all the dust. And when it was kicking up all the dust, it was kicking up all the tularemia from the dead rabbits that were uh, under, under the ground. And so that was uh, problematic as well because a lot of old people died because of it. So um, that's, uh, that's not good. So pretty much that comes down to where and how we get this infection. So not only is that transmitted from rabbits and all these things, but we actually get it from inhalation, ingestion, injection, leads to like invasion of regional lymph nodes that can disseminate. They infect macrophages and get migrated to lungs and liver and kidneys and cause all sorts of problems. And uh, the problems are listed all the way down here. So you have ulceroglandular. So this is uh, enters the body via like a scratch or abrasion. So maybe you're grabbing a rabbit and it bites you or something like that. Um, and this could lead to painful lymphadenopathy and ulcerative lesion. That's usually not problem problematic and your immune system usually fights it off. 
Uh, glandular, however, does not have ulcers. Um, it's pretty much the same thing as that, so no cutaneous lesions, but uh, tender lymph nodes. Oculoglandular, so uh, this actually is where it goes through the eye. So if you're uh, a butcher or something that, that, like that, and for some reason you're dealing with these animals or whatever, and uh, you actually get a little bit of blood and you wipe your eye with it for who knows why reason, but uh, it can give you conjunct uh, enter through the conjunctiva, uh, either from a blood splash or something like that, or rubbing your eyes. And uh, that can lead to purulent conjunctivitis and corneal ulceration. This is problematic in the eyes. Uh, it actually could cause uh, blindness in, in some rare cases. Oral pharyngeal type, uh, so pretty much this is ingestion of undercooked meat, uh, causes ulcers in the mouth, mouth called stomatitis. Exudative pharyngitis, um, such a, a very similar to um, things like uh, strep throat um, and, and other things. So, and. Uh, tonsillitis as well, which you can find in like EBV, abdominal pain and GI bleeding, nausea and vomiting. Uh, this is actually could be lethal. Uh, however, the problematic one is pneumonic. Uh, and so this is primary tularemia pneumonia. This is due to inhalation. It's very serious and, and lethal and uh, leads to like a dry cough, pleuritic type chest pain, um, bloody pleural effusion and hemorrhagic airways. And you can bleed out and it can cause ARDS, which could lead to that person's death. Um, remember, ARDS is something, uh, a rapid, progressive, uh, shortness of breath, dyspnea, decreased oxygen saturation, that even when you supply oxygen, nothing happens. Um, that's one of the key features that you find is that uh, it's refractory to, to O2 uh, administration. Uh, typhoidal as well uh, can be caused. This is actually very serious as well. And this is once it gets into the blood. Remember, uh, typhoid, uh, we called it typhoid once it got into the blood. So this is typhoidal tularemia, and that is bacteremia, and that can make its way to the lungs and, and cause death via ARDS as well. So key features uh, that uh, kind of separate it from other things uh, is you can have a uh, severe abrupt onset of fever, chills, and that remit and recur. We've had a, uh, one infection at least so far, uh, chikungunya, that remitted and incurred, but that wasn't chills and fevers, that was more joint pain. And then this guy is actually really specific, and I wanted to highlight this and, and underline it. This is pulse temperature disassociation. This is known as a Faget's sign. Uh, it is fever with bradycardia. So usually when you get an infection, just uh, think of any older infection, influenza, whatever. Uh, usually with every degree um, of Celsius or Fahrenheit or whatever that you increase in fever, usually your heart rate increases by a few beats uh, per minute. And uh, so this is known as association, so pulse temperature association. So increase in temperature, increase in heart rate. However, here it is pulse temperature disassociation, where you increase in fever and decrease in heart rate. It actually goes bradycardic. Uh, this is a key feature you want to look for in stems, and that will get you a nice diagnosis of tularemia. So brucellosis, uh, this is a non-motile, non-encapsulated gram-negative bacteria. Um, it's found in the United States, such as California and Texas. And uh, it is caused from multiple organisms, kind of where you find it. So Brucella uh, abortus is found in like cattle, Brucella melitensis. So this is the guy that we're really talking about as far as human uh, infections. And you get this from unpasteurized milk and dairy products. Uh, Brucella suisse, uh, which you get in pigs. And Brucella canis, which obviously from canids or dogs. Uh, transmission uh, and exposure, pretty much direct contact, such as lab workers or slaughter or, or baiters, uh, abaters, right? They're the guys that cut up animals um, for, for food. And then veterinary exposure, anything like inhalation, urine, feces, uterine products, uh, and an ingestion of unpasteurized milk. This uh, is actually one of the more specific things. Um, it can give you a brucellosis. So product, uh, it, what happens is uh, once it enters and you ingest it or inhale it or whatever, uh, you actually get uh, production of endotoxin. And this guy is an intracellular parasite and it survives in your macrophages, like in, inside the phagal lysosome. It doesn't even pop out of that. And then it could travel to the spleen, liver, and bone marrow, wherever macrophages are taking it. And it can cause granulomas and it can cause granulomas in those organs. If it's in the bone marrow, you can actually see this granuloma here. So this is a, a nice little uh, bone and that has formed a massive, if not multiple, granulomas. So this is very uh, kind of disgusting. Um, so symptoms, uh, human disease uh, is usually caused from that B melitensis, as I mentioned. This is known as undulant fever. So this is like um, 
uh, it should be drenching sweat with high fever and lethargy that recurs and, and goes away and comes back. So it just like keeps coming back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. High fever, not. High fever, not. High fever, not. So we talked about uh, recurring fever and chills. Uh, plus the pulse temperature disassociation and tularemia, and that's for tularemia. Here, it's just sweating, high fever, lethargy, and then it goes away. And then those three things come back, and then it goes away. Then they come back, right? Where then, when we were talking about um, chikungunya, that was more associated with reoccurring joint pain. So these kind of uh, some things you want to differentiate based on uh, something that reoccurs, okay? Um, advanced, so you can have GI symptoms, osteolytic uh, lesions, and, uh, sacroiliitis, all those sorts of stuff. And then you want to do serial blood cultures and PCR for, for a diagnosis. So now on to uh, one of uh, really interesting uh, bacteria is known as leptospirosis. This is caused from leptospira enterogrins. Um, and this is a coiled spirochete, and it's mo motile with endoflagellum. Uh, they are obligate aerobes, and they actually uh, have this question shape or question mark shape. You can actually see this. So you can kind of see this little question mark curl at the end. Um, that is uh, your leptospira enterograns. Um, and uh, the, usually you get this from small rodents and cattle, pigs, and dogs, and you get it in the, from their urine. Um, and so you, how do you get a rat, uh, a rodent urine on you or a pig urine on you. Obviously, if I'm s sitting at my house, there's not uh, cattle that are walking by the window and peeing on me. So how the heck do I get this? So usually you get it from contaminated water after like heavy rains. So heavy rain, heavy rain, heavy rain is high yield for remembering this guy. Also, you can get it from rodents in, you know, just think Oh, well, I used to work at Target, so if you went to the back room, we had a bunch of stuff set up. I'm imagining that there might be a rat in there somewhere amongst all the storage, everything that we have on, on those back shelves. And so uh, just imagine someone that works in a back room or a distribu distribution plant or something like that for retail products. Um, that there might be rats or rodents walking around in there urinating on top of soda cans and all those things. So uh, definitely be wanting to wash off the, the top of those soda cans. But as far as the heavy rains and stuff like that, uh, I put this kind of weird, I don't know what this is from, um, this uh, lady coming out of uh, the creepy water over here. And uh, yeah, so that's uh, what happens after heavy rains. This person could get leptospirosis. So uh, keep in Keep in mind that is how you can get that. And then uh, you can get it also through skin abrasions uh, and the conjunctiva as far as how it infects your body. So symptoms occur about uh, a couple weeks uh, after uh, initial infection. So you can have flu-like symptoms and severe myalgia. And one of the classic places you actually find this is in calves. So if you see someone having severe myalgia of the calves, this is something you want to be thinking of for leptospirosis. This is a very high yield point. Not a lot of things cause um, specifically calf pain, which is super weird. Um, yeah. So other things, you can also find it in CSF at this point in time. Uh, it also can cause jaundice, uh, and that can be a, a problem because it's uh, infecting your liver. Secondary phase, you can have retroorbital headache, similar to dengue, how we talked about that. Uh, remember when we mentioned that? So these are the two things you should be thinking for, retroorbital headache. Um, they also both cause hemorrhage. So you want to be looking for type of exposure. Was there recent travel? Was there recent rain? Did this person work in the back room? And that will give you more of a leptospirosis uh, type of um, differential over your dengue. So uh, it also causes abdominal pain. And then it got, causes a disease known as Wheels disease. So this is where it causes vascular collapse, thrombocytopenia. So this person might be bleeding or bleeding out of their gums and stuff like that. Hemorrhage, um, and then hepatic and renal dysfunction. And so that's something you might be able to see in increased creatinine and BUN. And then uh, conjunctival suffusion. So I actually put that picture up here in the top. Um, and so this is conjunctival suffusion. So what is conjunctival suffusion? You're like, oh, I know all these things with conjunctivitis. No, this is actually just severe reddening. It's not bleeding. It's not hemorrhage. And it's not actual like irritation, like inflammation as far as um, conjunctivitis goes with like adenovirus or Zika, right? Those where you had conjunctivitis and you could actually wipe off some of the, the gross, it has an exudate or like a discharge. Here, it is literally 
hyperemia of the sclera. So those blood vessels just dilate severely. It's not bleeding, just severe dilatation of those blood vessels that it looks like it's bleeding um, and there's no discharge. And so uh, we call this conjunctival suffusion. And then other things that can cause pulmonary infection, which can lead to ARDS, sort of like tularemia. So differential uh, diagnosis, look for that meningitis. Remember, this can uh, invade into the CNS uh, in uh, that initial phase, and that can cause um, a, a meningitis as well. But careful for uh, what, what is found in your CSF. And then uh, to diagnose this, this is actually known as MAT. This is a very specific thing. It's microscopic agglutination test. We don't use this for many things, um, but uh, for, for this guy, this is the one thing you should m remember for diagnosis. And here's a little rat peeing everywhere. So now on to Q fever. Uh, this is a, a cause from Coxiella burnetti, and this is uh, the guy up here um, on a, a scanning electron micrograph. And uh, this is an intracellular parasite. Uh, it's related to rickettsia, uh, like rickettsia rickettsii and uh, the typhoid and typhus, uh, but it is not a rickettsial disease. So there's no actual transmission vector, there's no arthropod vector that uh, transmits this, um, but it is carried in cattle and sheep and goats, usually from inhalation of placental products, placental products, placental products for acute fever. Um, and uh, pretty much people that are exposed to that are like vets or farmers, it makes sense. Uh, I'm not going to be exposed to any cattle placental part products anytime soon, and hopefully not. So the disease that it causes is a self-limiting flu-like illness um, and pneumonia in North America, and then the, the Q fever that is caused in Europe actually can progress to a hepatitis. I don't know why that why that is, but uh, sure, just straight memorize that one. So uh, for chronic stage, uh, it can last for years, and uh, it can actually invade or infect your uh, heart and cause culture negative endocarditis. So if you remember back to endocarditis, we had culture positive, which is like staph under patients that have you know a history of IV drug use or something like that or um, patients that have heart disease, like rheumatic heart disease, or they're really old and they had replacements of uh, valves or something like that. Those things, uh, patients are more exposed to other things like our strep group, strep uh, viridins, um, but also if it's a new like prosthetic valve that they just put in or something like that, that could also be uh, another staph, but this is more staph epidermidis uh, that causes that guy. And uh, as far as your culture negative endocarditis, so something that we can't take blood samples and grow anything on culture, uh, the most common is this Coxiella burnetti or Q fever. And um, remember risk factors for this guy, usually our non-culturable ones are, uh, we're gonna find growing on heart defects and valvular defects, something that predisposes them to having uh, endocarditis. So odd facts, uh, it has this phase variation, which is super weird. I don't know why it's high yield, but it is for no apparent reason. But uh, it actually has an infectious phase in humans. So when you have Q fever in a human, it has this normal LPS structure. It's gram negative. It, it has this normal LPS structure on it so where it's highly infectious and we can give it to people. Where in vitro, um, if for some reason it's not infection, it produces a truncated LPS. It's this weird other form of LPS, and so it's non-infectious. I don't know why that's high yield, but uh, just, just remember it for this guy. It's uh, some odd facts for this. Diagnosis, serology, and then treatment, doxycycline. When you ever have something really weird uh, as far as bacteria, give them doxy. <laughs> so now on to the big, big, bad boy Pseudomonas. Uh, this has come up in multiple multiple of uh, the modules as, as we've come along, and I want to emphasize some of the high yield points. So this mnemonic actually came from uh, first aid, and I uh, juiced it up a little bit, uh, made it a little bit beefier, and uh, so that uh, we can remember a little bit why uh, these things are associated with this uh, bacteria. So. It uh, is a motile gram-negative aerobic rod, and it can grow from anywhere from 4 degrees to 42 degrees Celsius. Um, and so this is a, a psychotroph and a, uh, um, a thermotroph as well, and it arranges in pairs, and then it also has oxidase positive. There's only a few things that have oxidase positive, and this is one of them. So uh, odd facts, it has like a grape smell, like a sweet or sweaty sock smell, which I don't know how sweaty socks and grapes are described as the same thing, but apparently they are. And it produces three pigments. Uh, so these pigments are pyocyanin. Uh, this is your blue color, and is why I have it in blue. And uh, pretty much the function of this is it catalyzes ROS. When phagocytes 
ingest it, it stops their ability to kill it. Uh, Pyoverdin is a, a yellow-green color, as to why I have it in a, a sort of, uh, I wonder, yellow-green. And uh, it functions as binding iron, so it's like um, uh, an ability for this organism to kind of grab iron uh, and, and keep it for itself. And um, it also regulates the exotoxin A, which we'll be discussing in a second, uh, its secretion. And then uh, pyorubin is just a red-brown pigment, uh, so be careful with this uh, as far as respiratory infections when you're coming up for step questions. Uh, something that has red-brown pigment as far as red-brown sputum, remember this is why I can't say someone that has red-brown sputum has strep pneumonia. That's the thing that I think of when I think of red-brown sputum or rust-colored sputum. But remember that pseudomonas can cause that same color using its pyorubin pigment. Usually it's yellow, usually it's green color. Sputum that comes up with so patients that have pseudomonas pneumonia, um, but it's not always. It could be uh, this red-brown pigment, so keep this in mind when it comes to that. Uh, usually the rest of the stem might help. If it's a CF patient, be picking pseudomonas over strep pneumonia um, for, for that question. And then uh, pathogenesis, it uses a type 3 secretion system and adhesions. It binds and migrates uh, and infects the tissue wherever it is, uh, skin or ear or uh, lungs. Um, it changes its pili. Remember, anything that has pili is able to have mutations in that to change that so that our immune system goes, oh, well, I don't have any response to you. And then uh, the B T and B cells recognize it and they start creating antibodies against it, but then it changes its pili. So now it's like, oh, this is a new infection. So it kind of evades for a longer amount of time uh, using those pili changes. It's kind of almost like disguises. Uh, interesting. Uh, and that can lead to the resistance. And then it has lipid A and LPS, uh, which that usually leads to a lot of the aspects of the disease, such as the necrotizing pneumonia and stuff like that. So what are these things? So if we actually spell out pseudomonas, you have the whole mnemonic on what uh, is associated with pseudomonas. So this came from first aid. Um, so P for pneumonia, and especially in CF patients, that's a high yield to, to remember. And uh, as far as uh, what comes as far as the color production or whatever like that, be looking for pyocyanin. And then it can cause sepsis, and this is due to the endotoxin, and ecthyma gangrenosum, which uh, usually is associated with this sepsis. <clears throat> Whenever you see ec uh, ecthyma gangrenosum, which are pretty much skin ulcers and immunocompromised patients, and this is due to the elastase that it produces, this is always pretty much a sign that this person has sepsis and we need to be getting them on antibiotics, or better ones, right now. Uh, UTIs, uh, they cause more complicated ones associated with like catheters and stuff like that. I remember uh, Klebsiella can also do that as well. Diabetes and drug use are your Ds. And uh, these are uh, kind of risk factors that you find for, for pseudomonas as well. Osteomyelitis, though this is following like puncture wounds, um, is the, where you're going to find pseudomonas causing that. It also produces a mucoid polysaccharide cap capsule. This is known as alginate. So I just think of pseudomonas causes algae in the lungs, which is kind of gross. Um, but that's how I remember that it has a mucoid polysaccharide capsule, which is like algae that grows on it. Ooh. And then uh, it causes otitis externa, and uh, this is known as swimmer's ear. It's very, very common, actually, that this causes that. And then it has nosocomial infections, especially in, in burn patients. Um, and again, that is um, associated with uh, the pyocyanin and, and stuff like that uh, for pneumonias. And then it has that A exotoxin or exotoxin A. Uh, what this does uh, is ADP ribosylation, which stops protein synthesis and elongation factor two. I'm sure you remember a couple infections that utilize the same mechanism with their exotoxin. Can you think of those two types of infections and where they're found? One in the GI tract or the lower GI tract and one in the upper respiratory tract. Hopefully you're thinking of Clostridium difficile, that does this with its exotoxin. In addition, hopefully you're thinking of Cornobacterium diphtheriae for the upper respiratory tract infection. And then it also causes skin infections, which we talked about in skin, as that hot tub folliculitis, which is really nummy, nummy, nummy. Uh, this is actually what it looks like in auger. It's really beautiful, actually. It's kind of cool. Uh, it's kind of like turquoise, blue, uh, green, yellow color. So now on to uh, other multi-system infections. Uh, that we'll be uh, covering uh, for the remaining of this module. All right, and now on to uh, these new infections. So uh, the first one we need to talk about, and we have before, is candida. 
Uh, so we talked about how it causes oral pharyngeal and esophageal, and I'm sure you are like, I've never hear the end of this. And yes, you will never hear the end of candida infections. So uh, usually uh, these occur in immunocompromised or AIDS patients or cancer patients or patients on glucocorticoids uh, as far as for asthma treatment or something like that, if they're on inhaled glucocorticoids. Anything that's going to diminish immune response uh, to candida will lead to candida infections. And uh, often for the AIDS patients, it depends on your CD4 count as to what infection you might see. So oral pharyngeal usually appears uh, anywhere around 500 or less cells per milliliter uh, of your CD4. And then esophageal, remember this is more specific to your less than 100 cells per milliliter to see that esophageal candidiasis. Uh, remember that scrapable lesions, they're kind of pustular lesions, white curdish like stuff in the esophagus um, with uh, some erythema. And then uh, it also can cause genital and vulvovaginal. Uh, that actually doesn't even require uh, a CD4 count uh, to, uh, to cause that. So uh, it's not something um, uh, as far as, as AIDS or anything is, is concerned. Um, it also can cause invasive, but usually, again, uh, when it's less than 100 cells per milliliter, can it can cause uh, that esophageal or further, such as candidemia. Another organism found within the candida group, so that, that above was uh, candida albicans that we've talked about so far. Uh, but this is a new guy. This is known as candida auris. And uh, this is, can cause a serious bloodstream infection. Uh, it's person-person transmission and 60% mortality. So you need to be paying attention when uh, this person has a diagnosis of this. Usually you find in ICU patients, ventilator patients, and central line catheters. Um, however, in order to differentiate this, and, uh, and the department really likes this, uh, to get a lot of people with this. People think it's at Candida Albicans. You see, oh, white Kurdish Candida Albicans. No. If you see a Candida question, read the whole question because it could be this one. On uh, microscopy, remember with Candida albicans, we can see germ tube, we can see budding yeast with pseudohyphae. You put all those three together, you have Candida. However, if you have budding yeast with pseudohyphae and no germ tube production, then you have Candida auris. There are other Candidas, but as far as the two that you should know, that's how you differentiate those two. Remember, no germ tube production for this guy, um, and that's what differentiates it. So don't miss, don't miss that question. Read all your questions. Don't just go, oh, I know this, and then skip. Always read every single question. You get a lot of points because of that. And it's kind of important to read all your patients' histories before you go to treat them as well. So next is Yersinia pestis. Uh, you did learn this a little bit earlier, and I just want to mention it here because uh, it kind of more comes into the multi-systems approach. Um, and uh, it's kind of uh, good to talk about. So epidemiology, as far as the United States comes along, uh, is in the southwest United States. So places like Arizona, California, Colorado, New Mexico, Utah, Texas, just the southwest United States is where you're going to find this guy. It's associated with fleas that uh, kind of carry uh, this guy from rats, which uh, the urban, uh, urban plague is uh, found within rats, and they're the natural reservoirs. And then uh, the vector that carries it between them and us are fleas. And then the uh, sylvatic plague uh, is going to be found in domestic cats and squirrels and rabbits. And those are the natural ones. And remember that vector is that flea again. Uh, and actually some of the hi history with this, uh, you actually uh, found doctors with this um, that, that had to go around and try to see if they could help anybody or, or pray for them or something like that. And so they dressed up like these really creepy doctors. But there's a reason for this, actually, why they had this kind of bird beak. Um, it's to, to show the locals, hey, there's plague in this area. Um, don't mess around in this, this, uh, this household or something like that if someone has plague and you see this doctor coming out of there. In addition, in this beak, they actually stored um, like uh, different fragrant uh, like flowers and, and rose petals and stuff like that, like potpourri found within this. So that uh, they, they, what they felt at that current time, you know this is back a long time ago, and uh, they felt that that was something that was going to keep the plague away from them was having strong scents or something like that, that they wouldn't breathe the bad air of someone with plague. And so that's actually why they uh, had this bird beak on the doctor's um, uh, faces and stuff like that. 
Um, and then uh, for pathogenesis, uh, pretty much it, what it does is it, it enters and resists phagocytic killing. And this has a type 3 secretion system. Uh, remember, this is Yersinia. It's related to your, Yersinia enterocolitica, which causes the GI uh, infections. Uh, but this guy's quite a bit worse. So it has this uh, YOP-H and YOP-E gene and YOP-JP. Um, and these uh, genes uh, promote the production of uh, proteins that dephosphorylates uh, phagocytosis, disrupts actin filaments for that phagocytosis, and initiates the op apoptosis of macrophages. So stops the things that were going to phagocytose them in the, in the first place. It also has virulence factors such as your fraction one gene. Um, this can, uh, encodes like an antiphagocytic protein capsule. It also has a plasminogen activator protease or PLA, and it degrades the complement and fibrin clots with, with that guy so it can kind of further invade around this whole person's body. Um, uh, so it's not trapped in uh, like complement or fibrin clots and stuff like that. Um, and so this guy has uh, definitely developed a, a way of uh, causing bad infections and that's why it caused a lot of death in, in people. And then uh, it also has absorption of organic iron uh, for, for nutrients for itself. So symptoms and, and disease that it uh, shows with is the bubonic plague. So this is like a severely high fever with painful buboes, which are like lymph swellings in the groin and axilla. Uh, this is actually is uh, a little child here with um, painful swellings in the neck. This is a bubo right here. Um, and this is something we need to recognize and then isolate them and keep them from everybody if you see this and you need to like try to decontaminate yourself if you see that um, this is a very severe illness um, and it's kind of hard to treat um, due to uh, this guy's kind of way of getting around and, and hiding from uh, treatments uh, it also caused the pneumonic plague which is a uh, uh, high fever malaise pulmonary science uh, this can be uh, human to human transmission and that's uh, very problematic as well and it, it, it invades uh, around in blood vessels and causes a lot of damage in different tissues one of the common things you actually see not only beyond buboes but you also see hand necrosis and extremity necrosis because it invades a lot of the blood supply and cuts off blood supply and this is someone's hand that is entirely necrosis uh, and gangrene and uh, it is very disgusting so next is adenovirus. Just a quick recap on this guy. We talked about this before. Remember, it's a double-stranded DNA virus. It's naked, icosahedral. Usually cause nasal or conjunctival mucosal infections. Uh, pathogenesis it re replicates in epithelial cells, and it can cause localized necrosis. Fever, rhinitis, pharyngitis in, in children. Conjunctivitis comes along with this. is a common thing that causes red eye, as far as what they call it in Grenada, or pink eye back in the United States. Um, it also causes uh, lower down respiratory infections and um, it can cause hemorrhagic cystitis. Remember, that's usually associated with swimming pools uh, and the hemorrhagic cystitis, kids swimming around in swimming pools and giving each other adenovirus. Um, and, and that's very uh, problematic as well. And gastroenteritis, the GI symptoms come along with this uh, upper respiratory tract infection. So that's why it's part of uh, multi systems. And then serology because it's uh, a virus. Coxsackie viruses A and B. Uh, we've come across uh, A before when we talked about skin infections. So this is a cosahedral naked positive single-stranded RNA. This is one of your percornaviruses. Remember, percornavirus uh, is your pec pec uh, positive um, or pec pec positive sense RNA viruses that uh, have what your birds are doing or your pigeons are doing. Uh, they're perching, so P-E-R-C-H, um, and that's where you kind of get these guys. That's the C. Uh, within these. So etiology uh, is poor sanitation, cr uh, crowded conditions, daycares, children, stuff like that. It's fecal oral as to why children are more exposed to this because, you know, they're licking their poop and stuff like that, uh, poopy hands. And uh, pathogenesis, so uh, it has oral exposure, obviously, and it invades lymph tissue and pharynx, uh, and, and it affects the M cells in the pyrus patches. It's something very specific that they like asking about this guy as far as where is the pathogenesis as far as the GI tract. Uh, infection and how does it get into the blood and system, especially, especially for Coxsackie B, uh, is that and those M cells of your pyrus patches and that causes uh, first or primary viremia. And then what happens, it goes around in the blood and then uh, can infect reticular endothelial cells in the lymph nodes, spleen and liver and stuff like that. And that uh, can cause, uh, once it infects those and then spreads again, it can cause a secondary uh, or second viremia. So the virulence, as far as where it binds, the respiratory tract is ICAM-1 or CD55 binding. Uh, CD55 is your uh, DAF, uh, which is associated when you have a deficiency in that, um, you have um, 
uh, a bleeding disorder that you have talked about in PATH. And uh, it causes lytic infections of target tissues. Polyprotein uh, is synthesized uh, within actually a few minutes once it, once it enters. And the symptoms of disease that this causes depends on what virus it is. So Coxsackie A, we talked about that in skin. This is caused herpangina. Um, remember, this is not herpes. This is herpangina. It causes fever, sore throat, dysphagia, and then vesicles that you find on the soft palate. Vesicles, not papules, but vesicles on the soft palate. You have Coxsackie A or herpangina. This is known as hand, foot, and mouth disease. You can also see these vesicles on uh, the hands as well. Uh, Coxsackie B, this is known as uh, an infection that can cause pleurodynia or devil's grip. And this is like acute pleuritic chest pain. It's almost like uh, the devil is gripping their chest so severely they can't breathe. That's how bad this uh, pain is, and it's very severe. Also can cause myocardial infections, um, so myocarditis, which uh, you did talk about when it came to uh, your cardio micro, uh, in addition to cardiopathology, when you're talking about myocarditis, this is uh, the guy that came up most commonly to cause that. And then par pericardial infections as well can come from this as well, uh, as far as a viral cause for that. Diagnosis, obviously a lice on PCR. And then if uh, this causes meningitis, because actually one of the most common causes of meningitis and encephalitis virally is your Coxsackie virus. Um, so please keep that in mind. This is one of the most common that causes that, and you will get to that when you get to C and S micro. All right, and so now onto your Epstein-Barr virus, which is HHV4 or human herpes virus 4. Uh, transmission from this, this is your kissing disease or mono. Um, you can also get it via sharing toothbrushes and cups like that. I don't know why you're sharing someone's toothbrushes, but you can still get it that way. It's kind of odd. Um, so, um, oh, kissing disease. Oh, back in the days. Oh, high school. All right, so uh, pathogenesis, so EBV and saliva-infected tonsillar uh, B cells. So pretty much what this does is uh, when it affects those B cells, it causes pharyngitis. It also immortalizes those B cells. When it immortalizes those B cells, uh, this is why it leads to so many of the B cell cancers we'll be talking about, um, T cells go, whoa, bro. Whoa, bro, B cell, what are you doing? Why are you over proliferating? Why are you overgrowing? What is wrong with you? Why are you doing this? So T cells respond to kill the B cells, kind of keep them at check, trying to tell them stop overgrowing, die, die, die. And so they kill a bunch of B cells, the B cells keep growing um, because they're immortalized. And so this kind of response leads to a lot of cytokines being released and that leads to the mono symptoms. And these T cells that are responding, respond in a really weird way, like an atypical reactive way. They're like a little bit sassy when they're killing these B cells. And these are known as downy cells. Uh, so these are your atypical reactive T cells or CD8 positive T cells. And this is one right up here. So they have this like oblong nucleus. Usually the nucleus is round and smooth um, and the cytoplasm is nice and blue, sort of like this downy bottle down here. And then they have these weird projections of their cytoplasm that usually they don't have this weird morphology where they're all kind of stretching out. They call these like ballerina um, cells or something like that because, or tutu cells, because they have this uh, kind of undulating membrane that are coming off these lymphocytes. Um, and so these are known as downy cells. And so I put this downy bottle because this is oblong, weird shaped. It's got a weird shaped nucleus. It's got a purple nucleus. Oh, look at that little downy bottle. And these blue cytoplasm. So this is exactly like a lymphocyte. It looks just like one. So uh, the virus uh, is a lifelong infection as to why uh, people have like a long amount of time that they have the infection, and it goes away and then it comes back, then it goes away and then it comes back. And so symptoms that are, are showing this are gonna be uh, your exudative pharyngitis with lymphadenopathy and splenomegaly. Um, and this person can have fever, malaise, and fatigue is a common com uh, like uh, complaint of patients that come in. Then they have this really weird thing. A lot of doctors decide to prescribe antibiotics to patients that uh, clearly they don't have a strep throat or something like that, but patients are like, give me antibiotics, give me antibiotics. Well, when you give them amoxicillin or ampicillin via IV, um, this person will have a rash. And so this person that has mono thinks that they're allergic to penicillin. And this is why a lot of patients that come into the ER will ask them, do you have any allergies? And they say, oh yeah, yeah, to penicillin. And we ask them what type of reaction was it? And they said, oh yeah, just get a little 
small itchy rash. Well, obviously that's not anaphylaxis and that's what we're worried about with penicillins. And so this person most likely might have had mono and we gave them a penicillin or like ampicillin or amoxicillin and they had just a simple rash to that. So um, that's something to always keep in mind when you're a doctor. And Guillain-Barre, uh, we talked about this earlier. Guillain-Barre is a complication of EBV and then uh, a, a major complication, and this is why we need to be careful with, uh, per, uh, especially teenagers that are getting this, is a ruptured spleen. So if you have a football player in high school, he's really good or something like that, maybe he's a quarterback or something like that, but he's making out with his girlfriend and then he has mono-like symptoms. He comes into you as a doctor. What do you got to tell him? Well, the first thing you got to tell him is, I'm sorry, but I'm going to have to excuse you from playing football for a little while. Uh, fortunately, I know it's your senior year and you want to get uh, brought into a really good college ball or something like that. But sorry, uh, I can't let you play contact sports or else you're splitting to rupture and you could die. So that's uh, a problem. And we don't want to let our, our patients go into that, those sorts of things. Wrestling and boxing and all those sorts of things can do that as well. Complications. So remember, since we or immortalize B cells, they can lead to Hodgkin's lymphoma and Burkitt's lymphoma and nasopharyngeal carcinomas. Those sorts of things can, can come arise because of this. And then uh, what we do is we do this monospot test, which we just check, check for heterophile antibodies, which are antibodies that can agglutinate horse or sheep RBCs. So we take horse or sheep blood and we throw in this person's plasma. If they have these antibodies present, it's going to agglutinate. We're going to say this is a monospot positive on the test. And then uh, we can also see histology of downy cells. And this is something, this monospot test, I will bring up right now. So now on to our cytomegalovirus, which is HHV5, or human herpes virus 5. Um, it is the most prevalent viral cause of congenital disease um, that, uh, that we can find uh, in epidemiology. So uh, the transmission from this can be sexually transmitted, urine, saliva, tears, um, and breast milk. And uh, the kidney transplants is also uh, a very high yield uh, point to kind of... Um, to, to uh, remember as far as how adults can get cytomegalovirus, and that is kidney transplants. And remember when we give someone that has a, transpl uh, a transplant, like a, like a kidney, for example, we have to put them on immunosuppressives. And when we put them on immunosuppressives, that leads to an increased risk of getting actually uh, a cytomegalovirus infection. Um, as far as that's going to show up in, in these guys down here. So the symptoms for this uh, kind of depends. For uh, congenital disease, it can cause microcephaly, similar to Zika. Um, intercerebral calcification, similar to varicella zoster or chickenpox. Um, hearing loss, uh, similar to rubella and a rash and mental retardation can also show up with this. Uh, immunocompromised patients, you can have pneumonia, pneumonitis, uh, that cotton wool retina or retinitis here, uh, colitis, and uh, esophagitis, as we mentioned in our GI sections. As far as this cotton wool, we have a picture up here on the top right. Um, it's pretty much uh, similar to uh, what cotton wool is, which is just raw cotton that we uh, kind of picked and pulled out the seeds. Uh, and it looks similar to this, and you can see these little patches of cotton. That's what we mean by cotton wool uh, retinitis. And that usually occurs when uh, the CD4 count is less than 100, uh, and we can find that on a, a ophthalmoscope. Uh, with diagnosis, we can uh, pretty much look at some histology of infected tissue, and we can find owl's eye inclusions or intranuclear inclusions. Uh, we can also do ELISA. And then uh, a side note here is that cytomegalovirus can actually cause Mono. It can cause a mononucleosis, infectious mononucleosis. So we can see reactive T cells um, responding to overproliferation of B cells, similar as we found in, in the last slide, like we talked about with EBV. However, the thing is, is that uh, in response to this, our, our cells do not produce heterophile antibodies. So there is no agglutination of horse or sheep blood like we found with EBV. And so this would be a negative heterophile antibody test. So this is a really good test question for micro and path and uh, you all when you get to term five or if you already have it or when you're prepping for uh, boards or even on your board exam. This is a really good question uh, based on pretty much do you know what mono is and what causes it and then simply do you know how to simply differentiate between uh, the two most common causes of mono and that is CMV and EBV. EBV is positive monospot test and CMV is negative monospot test. Uh, but remember, you have to do this test after a week of symptom presentation. Um, start uh, just because uh, you have to actually produce these antibodies, and it usually takes about a week or so, maybe even up to a couple weeks. Uh, so keep that in mind. Med School Tutor! You're at SGU, and you're thinking about step one. 
There are so many resources and so many opinions. How do you know which path to take? You've worked so hard and you deserve to match into the specialty of your dreams. Med School Tutors has helped nearly a thousand SGU students get their best scores on their CBSE and USMLEs through highly personalized one on one tutoring and individualized advice. Our SGU students see average Step 1 score increases of over 30 points when working with us. Scores that are their tickets to competitive residency spots around the country. Schedule your free phone consult today to be matched with your tutor. Med School Tutors, get where you want to go. So that completes our module. Thanks for watching. Uh, don't forget to subscribe and like, and uh, I hope that uh, this video was helpful. Um, our HIV and AIDS, um, the video will be uh, coming up next, uh, so definitely be looking out for that uh, in uh, the next uh, uh, submission. So uh, thank you for watching, and hopefully um, you're able to go and, and score real well on these exams uh, because uh, of what we've covered here today.